Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC. New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Community Education Centers, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Commerce Magazine. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, Haiti lacks access to clean water, and its people continue to suffer. The country may be very far from New Jersey, but organizations here are working hard to make a difference. Joining me here in the studio to discuss ways to improve the water situation in Haiti, we have Dr. Jay Migoda, who is professor and director of the Geotechnical Testing Lab at NJIT, that's the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Bob Iacullo, executive vice president of United Water. Our good friend Mike Marin, who got us into this in the first place and started teaching us about Haiti, president and CEO, Holy Name Medical Center, and finally, Mildred Antinor who is a university professor, media commentator, uh, with our partners at WBGO, an NPR affiliate in New Jersey, and also happens to be uh, Haitian American. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk to you about your experience. Your family knows Haiti very well. Um, but Mike, you did get us into this. You did start talking to us about Haiti. Talk to us about Holy Name's connection to Haiti and the hospital being built there because of your efforts and how we started learning about water. So our, our medical staff has been going to Haiti for the better part of 20 years. Dr. And Butler. Dr. Butler, Dave Butler, a uh, prominent member of our medical staff, OBGYN. And we always used to give him supplies and pat him on the back and say, we're proud of you, Dave. Good job. And that was the extent of our involvement. And after the earthquake, uh, Dr. Butler came back, Dr. Finley, one of our anesthesiologists, and they were visibly shaken. Mm -hmm. They had seen things that they had never experienced before. And they came to me and they said, you know, would you, you got to get involved a little bit more and, uh, and try to help us. And so we did. And uh, we stepped up. And that evolved to, in 2012, Holy Name becoming the official sponsor of Hapital Sacré-Cœur, which is in Milo, Haiti. It's the northern part of Haiti, about a half hour outside of Cap Haitian, which is the second largest city in, in Haiti. And talk about, as we show a video of the hospital, talk about what that hospital provides and then the water situation and has a direct impact on what you're able to do and not do. In northern Haiti, and especially in the, in the, in the district of Milo, the, the hospital itself is the, while providing essential care to hundreds of thousands of people, um, it is also the main economic engine. So it, it employs uh, more people than, than the government does in that area. We are the main driver uh, for, uh, for that entire region. So its role is, is, is critical. Uh, the health needs in Haiti are, are intense. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the, the lack of infrastructure, the environment that's there, the density of the population. Um, the tragedies that occur from the earthquake to the cholera. 2010 earthquake? 2010 earthquake, 2011 cholera epidemic. Uh, it just keeps uh, uh, manifesting itself in different ways there. Uh, the daily lifestyle is hard. Uh, there is no clean water on a regular basis. There is no clean water on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the, uh, uh, most of the Haitian environment, again, lack of infrastructure, so things that we take for granted here Such every as? day, roads, clean water, public utilities, electricity. Uh, Milo is remote enough, there is no public electricity. We have to generate our own to run the hospital through generators. Um, it's the, most of the people in the town, if they're fortunate, they have a small generator or they tap into the grid somewhere, uh, ours or someone else's, but they go without electricity. Uh, so the basic fundamentals, the core lifestyle there is drastically different from than it is uh, here. Mildred, put it into context because, by the way, Bob got involved in United Water. I think you guys actually met 
on a show that we were doing. You were coming to do different shows? That is yes. correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. It might have been in the green room. Yes, it was. It was. And you started talking. You both have businesses based in the Bergen County area. That's correct. Right? And you got involved. We'll talk about it in a second. Sure. Describe the life that you and your family know well in Haiti. Well, is it, is it match up with what Mike described? Pretty much. Pretty much. I would have to say that he's pretty accurate with that. Um, but I know that when I go to Haiti, um, I, it's a code shift. That It's an internal code shift that I have to do in terms of uh, thinking, okay, I can't run water. <laughs> um, when I'm brushing my teeth, I can't let the water run. You know, that's a luxury that we think that you we don't even think about. Run. No, you don't. You, you can't let water run. You can't let water run when you're taking a shower. Um, basically, you have to kind of lather yourself up and then you rinse yourself off. Um, and you have a lot of people outside of the city of Port-au-Prince who don't have access to um, clean water because some people do mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people don't. But those who are living in the rural areas, most of them don't. And so they really kind of relegate to kind of creative ways to get their water. Um, they use various chemicals, and then, of course, they boil the water, and then they clean themselves off, or they'll use the water for cooking. Right. Bob, jump in here. By the way, NJIT plays a big role here, and we'll talk about that in a second. But, Bob, talk about the connection, how you got involved, why you got involved, and what you're doing. Okay, how we got involved is just as you said, Mike and I were uh, in the green room for a separate taping. A couple of years back ago, in, I, think it was. I was yeah. in the probably the spring of 2013. Okay. And uh, I actually had not formally met Mike before that, and we got to talk, and Mike said uh, there may be an opportunity for United Water to help out uh, with a situation in Haiti. But he was, you were thinking about the water problem? <clears throat> yes. Okay, go ahead. And then uh, subsequent to that, we, we had further conversations. We signed a partnership agreement in the summer of 2013, and then went on our first mission in October of 2013. Well, initially, uh, the, the mission was to make an assessment of the water supply, the water treatment, uh, wastewater system, uh, if we could call it that, and sanitation needs, uh, primarily for uh, the hospital Sacre Cure, and then also to look at the water supply for the, uh, the town of Milo. Our interest in this is that uh, we're in the business of uh, providing safe, clean uh, drinking water and also providing wastewater services. That's our only business, and our employees are very dedicated to that. And we know how critical clean, safe water is to medical treatment and prevention. So we had a high interest in doing that. And our parent company, uh, Suez Environment, has actually been active in Haiti since 1995. Mm. And that activity intensified in 2010 after the earthquake. So it was something they where there was already an organization and a structure set up to start providing services, other services, uh, to Haiti. We're going to show a couple of pictures here, Bob. And this is 2014, Georgette. 2000. What are we looking at right here, Bob? Take a look. Uh, what we're looking at right here is actually the foundation for the chlorination system uh, that we were going to install, and this is at the, the hospital. So this is before, as we were prepping now? for it. Now you see the, the completed chlorination system. And that's two of our employees. On the left is Bill Prohoda. He's a hydrogeologist. And on the right is Hato Mystery. He's a senior project engineer for United Water. What have Water. they just done? They actually just put together a, a chlorination system, an automated chlorination system that was designed, piloted, and uh, actually fabricated uh, wow. here in New Jersey by our employees. Uh, and then uh, the, the hospital, Holy Name Hospital, shipped the chlorination systems over to uh, Haiti. And what potential impact does that have when you see that? So, um, so the uh, Haiti, uh, the, the place where um, uh, everybody's uh, talking, uh, is a, a, a city called Melo. And uh, it has a community of about 30,000 people. And, Milo and, has about 30,000 yes, people. Yes, and okay. um, the hospital actually serves more than 30,000. Right. Yeah, and also, do, uh, right after the cholera epidemic, uh, pretty much the northern part of the... It's all there uh, is. Yes. That hospital is all there is for a lot of people. Yes. Go ahead. So, uh, and uh, so we go, uh, when we go to Haiti, we actually... Uh, Who's the we? Uh, we are the Engineers Without Borders. Engineers of, Without Borders. Uh, of the New Jersey NJID chapter. Go ahead. And uh, we have been going since uh, 2007. And uh, we try to go at least once or twice each year. And we have very specific projects. Um, we try to implement. And uh, in 2008, I went, and uh, one of my mission was to actually test all the water sources in Milo. So we tested about uh, uh, 
10 different water sources. What did you find? Interesting. Um, uh, so uh, there's uh, two sources which were clean, pretty clean. Um, two of the 10? Two of the 10. One was the, the, the well where the, the hospital uh, gets the water. Right. It's a deep well. So pretty much uh, it's very clean uh, supply. And also, uh, the Haitians usually uh, get the clean water from uh, 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 Cap Haitian. Uh, they have a reverse osmosis plan. And um, where it's like uh, what you have under the sink. OK, um, so that works. In, yeah. in the interest of time, tell us what you found in the other eight. The other eight, uh, uh, usually they have, they have a broken down uh, water distribution system. Uh, they also take water from streams. So we went to all the places and sampled, and all of them have pathogens. OK, hold on, pathogens. One, uh, one second. You just said that they take water from streams. What's the problem with taking water from streams, Mike? Well, because if you saw the, the, because there's no sanitation in Haiti, the streams are also collecting grounds for all the garbage and waste that's left over. Wait a minute, hold on. So the streams have garbage in them, and therefore the water that comes out of those streams contaminated? Yes. yes. And people Absolutely. are doing what? Drinking it? Yes. And, and they're therefore, water buckets? Uh, to their homes, and then they drink, and they use that to cook. And therefore, what diseases are then people more greater have a greater susceptibility to? Is it cholera? Mostly Abs simple stomach problems, and and uh, it it gets uh, aggravated, and um, and they just keep doing this. Yes, and they recover, and then they uh, get again. <laughs> It's, it's, those are jumping. It's, it's a and really, by, by, does the government jump in and say, hey, well, we need to, to deal with that's this? That's the problem. It, it's a very, very sad situation. Because when you go to Haiti, Haiti is really a beautiful country, believe it or not. Beautiful it really country. is. I mean, it has a really beautiful landscape. The problem is that there's no real government leadership. There's no real effective leadership. And that's been going on for years and years and years. I think back in the, 19, the late 1960s, you have Francois Duvalier, who actually instituted this, uh, this uh, water filtration um, company to, um, to clean the water up. And that went as far as Port-au-Prince, or some areas of Port-au-Prince. Uh, late in the 1970s, his son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, who just died a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, took over and actually Actually, um, you know, uh, took that over, but it didn't really go throughout the country. It was only relegated to some areas in Puerto right. primarily the elite. Mm -hmm. And so, so what happened to the rest of the people? They had to make do with what they had. And so they so, became very creative. I mean, some of them knew enough to boil the water or to put various leaves, you know, um, mm -hmm. in the, yeah, to, to use, um, <laughs> to kind of clean it up and then to boil it to get rid of some of the germs. They did the best that they could, that they could with what they had. So, so, so you got private organizations. Mm -hmm. You got a not-for-profit hospital. Mm -hmm. You got a, an organization, you know, United Water, with a parent company. So as environment jumping in and mm -hmm. doing what you can do. Engineers Without Borders, connected mm -hmm. to, you know, NGIT, an academic institution, making the impact that you can make. Mike. Yeah, oh, it, oh. It, it, it seems like a, uh, you know, an, an incredible task. Um, but I'll tell you, Jay and his students, uh, NGIT, they've been fabulous. Bob, as I've said here before, and, and what United Water has done has been incredible. Um, and, and, and milk, Haiti is a gorgeous country. I mean, there, there's just the landscape and, and the people, right? But they what? have strong resolve. Yeah. But what, Mike? But it, it suffers from uh, a, a lack of focus and a lack of, uh, in, in some regards, us, right? We, we can also become the problem. How, whoa, how, we're sitting here talking about what you're doing. And you're saying we could become the problem. I don't understand. Well, because there's, there's no long-term, sustainable, consistent engagement. And so they, Haiti suffers, as one of my board members always says, from a bad case of good intentions. <laughs> and there's a lot of us who want to go down and help, and we're well-intentioned, but we do it in short stints, and it's a, it's a big lift. And so people get overwhelmed by that, and then they retreat and say, well, I did my best, or I feel good about what I did. I made a slight difference. But Haiti doesn't move forward. It falls back. And the Haitians that I've come to know, in many regards, resent that. And so when the, when the blonde, when we come down... The, um, Is that you refer to us? Yeah, yes. we, they refer the to blonde. us as the blonde, the whites. Um, we, are, we are looked at with some skepticism. We're also, they've also, uh, and they caution about becoming 
too parasitic because it's easy for them to say, well, just give me, mm. and then I don't have to take responsibility or accountability for my and own And that doesn't action. work. It does not work. And so our model is very different. It's to build accountability. It's to try to this build. There's a holy name model. Yeah, and try to build sustainability. And that's why when we can find partners like United Water and JIT, where we can craft long-term sustainable interventions. And it's hard because you have to be patient. But also someone has to be the quarterback on the other end. Correct. So someone we, has to lead the effort on the other end. Correct. And we're fortunate. We have, we have Dr. Harold Preville, who's a, a, a Haitian physician, who is the CEO of the hospital there, and he works with me. And he's the one who carries the water on a daily basis. And his senior team now, which has evolved quite nicely over the last couple of years, and they're, they're, we are instilling this culture of accountability and responsibility. And, and on your end, I mean, you listen to everything your, your friend and colleague just said about the blonde, if you will, and, and the whole question of well, res potential resentment. Your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, the, the sustainability is, is, is key to any, any water supply system or wastewater system. For instance, with the chlorinators. Yeah, that looked great. People yeah, look at that and go, hey, it, it, look, it, that's terrific. It's Things are turning it's, around, it's, but, yeah, but it's, what? It's, it's simple. It was inexpensive. You're talking about a $500 investment per chlorinator, but you have to monitor the chlorine residuals to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do in terms of killing the pathogens and, and so forth in, in the water. You have to refresh the hypochloric pellets that are being used. Uh, so it's, 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 it's Who's doing that on the other end? Well, we, we developed, not only did we, we install and operate to make sure they were working properly, but we put together a standard operating procedure. So again, there, there should be sustainability. Right. Uh, and we've made some other recommendations, particularly you know, having the uh, system in, an, in a locked enclosure so no one could make unauthorized adjustments to it and so forth. But again, you, know, you, you, you need to have somebody monitoring the situation. You can't just do this and then walk away and you know, leave it on its Are own. Are you at the mercy of, of how effective the implementation is in terms of monitoring on the other end? Yeah, but making sure that people understand how it operates and what needs to be done on a continuous but it, basis. But it's much better. So let me give you two, two scenarios of what it was like before. I mean, there's a silver lining here. Yeah, well, before this, the automated chlorinators were designed and specifically to be low maintenance, on the ground. I mean, easy, easy to, to manage. Yeah. Um, and it, I'll give you two examples. One of good intentions that really went bad. So um, very well-intentioned NGO organization donated these solar-driven filter systems that you would put at the well head, and, and the water would come out, and it would go through an elaborate filter system and then come out. The problem with that is those filters need to be back flushed, cleaned, oh and maintained on a regular basis. Complicated? Yeah. Very complicated. Mm -hmm. And, and what we found is that in very short time, the filters were actually probably causing more damage than help because they weren't being back flushed, they weren't being maintained properly, um, and the system ultimately collapsed. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it was too complicated for the environment. The flip side, so once the filter system failed and no one had confidence in it, we had staff climbing 30, 40 feet in the air to a water tower, literally with a bottle of bleach Clorox bleach, and they would measure, you know, in, in a very, <laughs> you know, simple way, just how much bleach they put in. And sometimes they would overchlorinate, and sometimes they would underchlorinate, and sometimes they wouldn't find anybody willing to climb the 40-foot uh, trek to the top of the water tower, especially when there were some snakes up there. <laughs> and, and so the, sometimes the water would get chlorinated, sometimes it wasn't a reliable system. You know, it's interesting. Mike talks about you know, the climbing up the tree and the bleach and, you know, and it's, it's humorous on one level and that's not the intent, but, but on the other side, and I know Mike and everyone understands this, for some, and this is life and death, right? Put it in perspective. It's, well, the problem is bigger than the water. Um, I mean, the wonderful work that United Water and uh, the uh, hospital are doing, I think that's wonderful. I mean, there are other companies also, mm -hmm. other American companies coming into Haiti to, to help. But uh, the infrastructure is just totally non-existent. I mean, you, there are no roads, no viable roads, no uh, sidewalks in terms of um, paved sidewalks that people can walk on. Um, there are problems with the phone system, the telephone system. Pre-earthquake? Pre-earthquake, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, 
it's always been that way. As I mentioned before, um, the only president that we know of that, that actually started to organize some system to chlorinate the water was Francois Duvalier, and his son actually took over after that. Where is but the demand on the part of, listen, this is not a program, this is not a series on public broadcasting that focuses on international affairs. The truth is, we do this series in part because Mike brought this to us as a longtime friend, but also because there's a large Haitian American population here. Mm -hmm. Question, where is the demand on the part of the Haitian people to say, hey, we deserve better? Or is that a naive question? No, that's not a naive question. Um, the Haitian diaspora um, has for years, I mean, it's always been this way. They've basically supported Haiti on their own. They've supported their own little corner of Haiti on mm. their own. So you have people who were either born here, like mm. me, or people who were born in Haiti. They came here as children and they, they got educated here. They're living here. Their lives are here. They send money back to their families. And that's how they support their own little corner of Haiti because the government's not doing it. So, so go back to the part about here. NGIT is involved. Mm -hmm. Your companies are involved. Am I correct that a big part of the reason that we in New Jersey and the New York, New Jersey region are involved is because there are so many Haitian Americans here? Is that a fair assessment? Yes and no. Um, so we got involved uh, because of uh, Crudum, and uh, there was um, one of the doctors uh, which uh, told me that uh, he, uh, he's a gynecologist, he, he wanted to go and practice his uh, profession. Uh, but unfortunately, he cannot do anything because uh, all his patients come with uh, stomach problems, mm. which is so trivial. Well, which is, excuse me, again connected to the water? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's funny, you'd be to well, we're talking about something else and it comes back to water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, so um, he said that this, this is not a doctor's issue, this should be an engineer's issue, uh, that uh, en engineers should get together and um, find solutions. So we have a very simplistic uh, solution we propose and uh, we are implementing, and also is funded by Aquafund, um, where we, uh, we, uh, we provide the knowledge to Haitian community uh, or the uh, Milo. Um, what does it mean to the Haitian community? That's a broad description. Uh, Who particularly? So the the uh, the Crudem also has a. Crudem is the foundation. Let's be yes. clear. Mike, put that in perspective. So Crudem is the U.S. foundation, now a subsidiary of Holy Name. That Your hospital. That, yes, that that financially supports and coordinates efforts on behalf of Hospital Sacre Coeur in Milo. Got it. Got a few minutes left, so go ahead. So, um, uh, so it, it, uh, the Kuram also has a sister organization there. It's a, it's a technical school, and mm -hmm. uh, we approached them, and uh, we uh, hired a group of uh, the, the students and uh, got them educated uh, on uh, uh, constructing a very simplistic device. And uh, right now, they, they are manufacturing them and distributing. And that device does what? That provides clean water, 95% uh, and that's Pathogen a concrete free. box, as we show. Yes. It. Describe that box real quick. So it's, it's, it has a shell, uh, which that's is it? A, yes, very uh, simple box. Um, uh, the the, the, the dip, most difficult part is to make that uh, uh, concrete shell. And are then, all those materials found in Haiti? These are all made in Haiti. And so it's doable. Yes, very doable. Mm -hmm. And and our solution is actually, we we think that we should not bring any technology from uh, uh, outside Haiti, and they should what we are doing is we are trying to educate them and they could generate because as we talked about Bob it's got to be done on the other end right that's right yes. for it to be sustainable sustainable yes right. a couple minutes left reason to be hopeful is the reason to be helpful the reason to be hopeful to hopeful again uh, when we made our first mission out there our team had made 10 recommendations nine of them were implemented the other one which was to put in a liner was done when we were there so to me, that was very encouraging, that things were, were actually being done. And I believe with the chlorination systems, at least, again, with the standard operating procedure, as Mike said, the simplicity of it, keeping it on a ground level, using the hypochlorite uh, pellets as opposed to uh, liquid uh, sodium hypochlorite, keeping things very simple, that they should be very sustainable. And you believe, Mike, in the limited time we have left, all the years you've been doing this, mm -hmm. despite all the challenges, and Mildred knows this better than most, you remain optimistic because? Because every day I, I find people like Jay and Bob and Mildred who, who understand, uh, who, uh, who appreciate all that they've accomplished here and have a sense of we need to give back. 
And so, as Bob articulated, you can make a difference there with very little effort. You just have to be focused, and you have to put it in the in the proper context. So if we, and that's our role. Our, so our role has sort of evolved to be a coordinator. There's over a thousand medical volunteers who go to, go to Haiti through Crudem through Holy Name. Our goal is to make sure they are consistent in the message and the mission of what they do, that they train the Haitian staff to be sustainable, and they convey a culture of accountability and responsibility. Our role is to continue to shed a light, uh, shed important light on this important issue. Um, we're a New Jersey-based program in this area, but there are so many people who continue to suffer, and thank you for bringing this issue to us, and thank you all for helping us tell the story. Thank you very thank much. You. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, New Jersey Natural Gas, Qualcare Inc., Community Education Centers, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This program has been made possible in part by the Fidelco Group. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone.